So the presentation today is around state capture and its implications for uh, civil society. So the Public Affairs Research Institute uh, has done extensive work on this um, in the last five years and so they'll be sharing that with us today as well as current efforts uh, to develop proposals around state reform. Um, this is a topical social justice issue for us as the consequences of state capture extend way beyond financial distress to um, the erosion of institutions and systems that uphold um, human rights and therefore extend to issues such as poverty, such as unemployment that we're seeing right now. So while we do have the Zondo Commission, um, the apparent lack of accountability is concerning. And the question is not only what should civil society be doing, but what should we have done? And what should we have done better? So Perry is here to talk us through their experience and a bit of background into their work. Um, their work revolves around the effectiveness of state institutions um, in delivery of services and infrastructure, and it involves research around drivers of institutional performance, but their work goes beyond the research. They do interact with change agents in the public service to address institutional blockages and weaknesses. Yes. So the team is led by Dr. Mbogiseni Butelezi, um, he's the executive director of PERI, and he's an academic and activist of note. Um, his main interest is how the state interfaces with citizens in various areas, including land restitution, the role of traditional leaders in governance, heritage, and uh, public archives. And he has published extensively in these areas. So we can do we've that. actually yeah. prepared a very short um, presentation in four parts, we can do that. Um, which is going to be really just a provocation. Uh, part of it is that we ourselves have a lot of questions which we would like to put to people in this room and to deliberate together about um, what was the role of civil society in the failures that we saw in the state uh, and particularly the question we, we are grappling with is why did it take us so long as civil society to get to a point where we had consensus on what was happening in the state um, and therefore to get to a point where there was sufficient mobilization uh, for Zuma to go and for things to change in the state. It took us a long time, I, I, I would contend, um, and looking back in, in hindsight with uh, the revelations that have happened at the Zondo Commission, um, the Public Protectors uh, State of Capture report, and um, other uh, kinds of revelations, especially uh, the Gupta leaks. Um, we are now in a position where we can see um, that by the time Zuma left, or by the time Zuma was deposed, um, st state institutions, critical state institutions, had been damaged uh, quite significantly. Here we're talking about the National Prosecuting Authority, we're talking about the Hawks, we're talking about um, I mean, some of the, 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 the less known institutions, such as the Anti-Corruption Task Team. And just to talk about the Anti-Corruption Task Team for a moment, one of the things, and Sarah could uh, to come in on this, that we, we found out four years ago uh, when we were engaged in writing um, a, a diagnostic towards the national anti-corruption strategy, was that when um, Tanda Zonkemeza was head of the Hawks, um, the, the head of the Hawks is responsible for convening all the state agencies um, and, and meetings at which they decide which corruption cases uh, they're meant to prioritize in the country in investigating, etc. When Mtanda Zonkemeza became head of the Hawks, he stopped convening those meetings. Simply stopped convening the NPA, the Hawks, um, the National Intelligence Agency to sit around the table and say which are the cases of corruption we should convene. So, we, we, I mean, by the time um, Zuma left, we could see, and we see now in hindsight, that the damage goes a lot deeper than we thought. The other thing, and uh, this is something that we, we, we struggled to, uh, to find traction when uh, at some point um, 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 organizations like ours and others were involved in trying to bring this to public attention, was the destruction of um, the, the careers of a lot of public servants. Um, the institutions like the Public Service Commission uh, that are meant to play a critical role, central role actually, in protecting the careers of public servants, in uh, ensuring that when they are being asked to do nefarious things, there's somebody who stands up and speaks up for them. They simply did nothing. Um, and we realize that the damage goes deeper when you, you see it at that level. When those institutions that are not in the public eye, you also realize that uh, they've also suffered 
a severe amount of damage that uh, had their wings clipped, clipped um, over a long period of time and they're not doing what they're supposed to do. But um, the one uh, thing um, that we've heard over and over again, both I think um, during the Zuma years, but particularly in hindsight, is that the media and the judiciary were the bulwark that uh, saved us against, um, or saved us from the worst excesses that could have happened. And that happened partly because of the work of uh, some of the people in this room, um, people who worked in the media space who constantly, I think throughout this period and going much further back, were revealing what was happening, sometimes in very, very difficult circumstances. But secondly, it is also the work of some of the organizations represented in this room who were um, going to court to challenge some of the things that um, were happening in state institutions, that um, were happening in parliament, that um, were being done by Zuma. But we need to also remember, this goes a lot further. State capture is not the Zuma Gupta nexus. It goes a lot further. And what, where, where it goes further, and where I think we still need to, all of us need to still do a lot more thinking, is how does this play out at, this, at, the, at the local level, for example, local government? Um, we've done some work in some municipalities where we've, we, I mean, there's some, been some revelations, and one of our colleagues, uh, Crispian Olver, uh, has done a very interesting couple of books, and with a third one in progress. One was Nelson Mandela Bay, one on Cape Town, and now he's doing one on Johannesburg. Where at the local, uh, but he's looking at metros, this goes a lot further. We've done some work in Mohalakwena and Lepalale in, in, um, um, up in, in Limpopo, where we are seeing this phenomenon um, of their coordination between certain public servants, certain political networks, and certain business interests to get around, to coordinate around the rules, particularly in the procurement space, which um, my colleagues uh, can talk more about. Um, we're seeing this repeating itself at so many different levels, but we've focused a lot on the Zuma Gupta Nexus um, and a little bit on others. Uh, think Bosasa, think um, Agritzi, who's at the State Capture Commission again today. But I think our work still needs to go a lot further in analyzing what happened. And I think uh, a, lot, a lot more work by a lot more organizations still needs to be done in this space. But the point I was making was, I think there's consensus now that the media and the judiciary were really our saving grace. But the question then, I, again, uh, we're trying to get to is why did it take us so long? That's a question we want to deliberate together with all of you about. Why did it take so long when the public protector, for example, had released the state of capture report. Um, and what can we do differently going forward? Um, I think one of the things um, that we want to try and persuade you today is that the state matters, institutions of the state matter, and that civil servants, the bureaucracy, and who gets appointed and how they get appointed into the bureaucracy matters. And my colleagues will talk more about that. My, I want to hazard um, an initial uh, take on this. Um, why did it take us so long? One of the reasons, and this is one of many, was that the diversity of civil society itself and the cacophony of voices that we hear in civil society was partly one of the mitigating factors against us reaching consensus on what was going on. What do I mean by that? I think it's very difficult to persuade one another. And we saw that, I think, in the state capture uh, uh, process. That is, we found it very difficult to persuade one another what this thing that we're seeing happening was. What, what we're seeing happening, we, we named it in different ways. We named it corruption. Um, and yes, there is corruption. But the bigger picture of what was happening, of how, as we've argued, and I'll get to this in a moment, um, there was a political, a big political project uh, behind this. Um, is something that we found very difficult to persuade one another about. Um, why is that? Uh, I, I want to just quote something recently from a recent interview I did uh, with Bali Pityan. I put him exactly, to him exactly this question of why did it take civil society so long? And he says, um, my view is that civil society are the same people who are in the political parties, who are dining out with politicians and others, and who ultimately vote these very people into power. So, this is one of the problems. Oh, it's, not, it's not a problem, but this is one of the one of the realities that we face. That um, some of us sitting in this room are the very people 
who this evening are going to be dining out with senior members of the African National Congress. And therefore, the very civil society is very deeply embedded and implicated uh, with those in power in the state, in political parties, etc. And therefore, we then had this problem where the counter narrative, the narrative that, uh, or the radical economic transformation narrative, which is very persuasive and actually has some elements of truth in it, as uh, Trace will talk about later, um, we, we couldn't agree um, whether this was state capture or whether it was, it was radical economic transformation. But there was a turning point, um, and I mean, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go into detail in, in, in um, uh, how this all unfolded, but just to touch on a few elements. I think one of the turning points, of course, was the release of the Public Protectors Report in 2016. Um, and that report came at a time when the Zuma must fall mobilizations had been very slow, had not been able to uh, gather enough momentum, had not been able to persuade enough people to come out into the streets to march against Zuma. But in 2017, we began to see a momentum building. Um, our own work, which is what I'm going to focus on, um, somehow fortuitously managed to hook into this moment. And that particular piece of work was the Betrayal of the Promise Report, which was released um, in May 2017. How did that come about? That report um, came about, as a, Mark Swilling uh, writes a little bit about this in the introduction to the book version uh, of that report. He bumped into Mgenisi mm -hmm. Jonas, after Mgenisi mm -hmm. Jonas had made his revel revelations on a flight from Cape Town to Joburg. And Jonas said, what are academics doing? You're all fiddling while the country is burning. He said, where is the academic analysis of what is going on in this country? And that challenge um, that Mr. Jonas gave to Mark Swilling, Mark Swilling then uh, began to try and, and get other organizations, uh, academics involved in this. And he, he lobbied a number of organizations, most of whom, and a number of um, individual academics, most of whom declined to get involved. Why did they decline? For fear. This was a time when uh, intelligence agencies were being used against people who were seen as the enemy of radical economic uh, transformation, as the enemy of the Zuma Gupta Nexus, including some of um, uh, our partner organizations, some of the organizations represented in this room. Remember, um, there was a period when there were very mysterious break-ins into offices of certain organizations. And we still have question marks, in fact, about an incident that happened in our own office about whether this was uh, part of that intimidation of civil society actors. But what followed from there was that um, we got involved um, I I at Paris uh, with um, uh, Mark Swilling and others in writing the report called Betrayal of the Promise, which was written very quickly. Um, and ultimately, uh, it, it got published under circumstances where, I mean, we, we launched it at VETS, under circumstances where we ourselves thought we needed to be very careful. The reason why, if you look at that report, I forgot to bring my copy of it, um, there's a, a whole list of people listed as authors. Really, there were two primary authors of that report, Mark Suling and Ivor Chipkin. The rest of us um, um, commented, got involved at the edges, partly because we wanted to dilute the identity of who was involved for fear of repri reprisals. But something very fortuitous happened. We launched that report on a Thursday. That weekend, the Gupta leaks came out. And partly what that did was it took the heat of us. I mean, we were scared. Some, some of us scared for our lives because we thought we were going to face the heat. But the Gupta leaks came out. And what the Gupta leaks did was they actually confirmed a lot of what was in the, the analysis of that report. The analysis of that report essentially says there was a political project behind this. This is not just a random collection of people who were looting. It was a coordinated political project. And that political project, what it was attempting to do, was indeed um, to find ways to coordinate around the rules of the state, uh, coordinate business interests, political interests, as well as uh, certain public servants. And this is where we saw public servants were trying to stand up against this, getting destroyed, getting pushed out of this public service, um, getting dragged into litigation for years and years that exhausted their financial resources, exhausted their pensions. Um, in order for this political project um, to function, what it needed was a narrative, a central narrative. And the radical economic transformation narrative, I think um, with the, some element of truth in it, was very useful and very persuasive for some people. And this is why 
partly in civil society, but in society more generally, we couldn't agree on um, what was going on. Um, that political project um, was driven by a, a, a I mean, sets of uh, political uh, or sets of actors that were linked to each other in different ways. They were not all very coordinated. That the project was not as coordinated as we want to think. It was um, part, part, what some people have called kitchen cabinets, um, with um, uh, Zuma as one of the people who were central to coordinating these political networks and drawing on different networks at different times for, for different things. Um, even that analysis, of course, has run into um, a lot of criticism. The report, I think, um, I mean, as an academic uh, piece of analysis, was not terribly robust, I, I admit that. Uh, it was a, a, a polemic in some ways, and it needed to be done quickly to try and put something out to start a conversation. The conversation has um, and grown tentacles and moved in different directions in very uh, interesting ways, and I was hoping uh, David Lewis would be in the room because he's one of the people who disagree with the analysis in that report. Um, but I want to also point out, uh, before, as I move towards the end, that within our own organization, there was serious disagreement, both about the process of getting involved in uh, that report, but also about the analysis uh, in that report. Why am I uh, bringing this up? Partly to say, the point I'm making about how we could not, we struggled to get to consensus about what was happening, the, the, even within the microcosm of our own organization, this was going on. This is partly because in the organization, there is no party line where all, all our researchers, and we argue these things out and we disagree, as you might hear in, the, in this room. Some of my colleagues might disagree with what I've just said. So when, when um, in fact, we were approached to get involved in writing the Betrayal of the Promise report, they convened a meeting, um, and in that meeting, there was serious pushback from even some of our own colleagues who were saying, what is the problem with getting involved in such a project is this is just factional battles within the ANC, and we are now embedding ourselves within the faction of the ANC by getting involved in an analysis that places the Zuma Gupta Nexus at the center of what was happening nationally. So I think the, the, within that microcosm, we see, we see elements of what was happening in the country and why we couldn't get to a consensus about what was going on. And then, um, but we, we then, we, we, we did do the work and there continued to be rumblings even after the report was published. Um, and we followed that report up with then setting up a, a program of action. Uh, that Florencia, who I'm going to hand over to now, is going to uh, uh, talk more about, that we're still continuing with, uh, with uh, to this day. So let me stop there with that background and context and then hand over to Florencia. Okay, thank you, Mbongiseni. Um, indeed, I just want to give you some of the, uh, a brief sense of where Pari has gone with his work from, from kind of the background that Mbongiseni just mentioned. Uh, about two, two years ago, we we started what we called, and again, this is, I think, a, an example of kind of work in progress and, and a changing uh, how things change and how and, and that kind of contestation or disagreement within the organization. It was called initially the after capture program, right? This idea that we had captured, now we're coming after capture. And I think it was, but capture is not done. Right? And this is the realization that capture is not done. Cap capture continues in very many different facets. So we started to think much more in terms of the sense of um, state reform, yeah. uh, looking at key areas of state reform. But nonetheless, uh, in 2018, when we started working, uh, taking some of these initiatives forward, what we did is we organized a, a series of round tables um, and many of you maybe just participate, might have participated in some of them, which was trying to also illustrate this, this idea of capture in different uh, contexts. You know, how does it affect health? For instance, I mean, so we talked about life as a domain, we talked about, we had a, another session on procurement, we had another session, we had sessions also uh, because of Paris strength in looking at uh, issues around recruitment, issues around procurement, yeah, the work on the contract state, previous work. Uh, we also did uh, engagement with the Public Service Commission, 
which you know we've got this entity that needs to be strengthened and really put to use and also with the public sir with the um, DPSA uh, so we did an, a series of roundtable discussions that led up to a conference we did a, a quite a about a three-day conference in October of 2018 uh, where we also wanted to explore this issue of capture analytically right think about it much more theoretically academically not only looking and we we had a whole call for papers in South Africa but we also invited a number of international scholars to talk about uh, experiences of capture, or notions of capture in the in the continent, and from that, so the idea was not only to analyze and to look at, and also to look at what did civil society, what has civil society done in many different facets. So we had a whole day where uh, we had different presentations by different uh, civil society actors about the kind of work that they were doing to deal with kind of different facets of this, um, and certainly. Uh, we had uh, great presentations also by a number of investigative journalists and also looking not only at the state and how the state you know, is involved, but also looking at um, those who should have been doing the oversight, right? those who should have stopped half of what happened, or more than half of what happened. Um, and then from that, from that conference, what we wanted to take forward as party and looking at, at party's strengths was to start thinking about where are key areas of reform um, that we need to start looking at. Um, how do we, you know, this has happened, it continues to happen, what do we do to minimize it in the future? What are some of the things that we can start doing at a level of, you know, particular practices within the state that, uh, so that we can start influencing that debate? So, it's a it's more of a, a kind of a longer term approach if one can say to advocacy to intervention right it's about looking at okay what is the legal framework telling us what are what are some of the uh, practices already in government that might need to be changed procedures yeah laws procedures etc um, and so from there uh, we've developed we set out to develop a number of what we call position papers so we've developed with the in cooperation with civil society organizations so throughout last year we we did an engagement with civil society organizations <coughs> around three key areas of state reform one was on the recruitment and dismissal of uh, officials in the public service and in municipalities the other one it was looking at uh, public procurement reform, which is now very apropos since the draft, the uh, public procurement bill has been published and is up for comment. And also we looked at appointment and dismissal procedures in key agencies of the criminal justice system. So looking at the NPA. So we just repeat your last Sorry? The appointment. Oh, appointment and dismissals in uh, key institutions in the in the criminal justice system. So, we're, sorry, do you want me to look this way? Yeah. Which microphone? Where is the microphone? Uh, okay. Oh, okay. This, but this is our microphone. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I'm not sure where I'm supposed to look. <laughs> okay. Uh, it better to stand up as well, it's oh, so up. sorry. No, no, I'm just suggesting because I don't know if they can all hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm trying to figure out. Okay, but oh. I know we're gonna get this right. <laughs> So the third area, uh, as I was saying, was looking at uh, appointment and dismissal procedures in key uh, institutions, in key agencies within the criminal justice chain, if we can think about it. So we looked at the police, at the, at the NPA, at the Hawks, and IPID. So we were looking at what is it, you know, what are key proposals that we can put forward, that we can take forward, so that we can, in a sense, minimize what we've experienced. I think we're not naive enough to think that we're going to do away with it. But how do we, cl how do we close some of these gaps? 
And so we did, we developed these proposals in, in consultation with a number of civil society organizations. And now we're at the stage where this year, uh, and also what we did last year, which was I think very important in trying to set it as a, as a yearly event, is to have a conference that continues to address the issue of state capture. And we continue to look at, you know, how it is, the, its metamorphosis in many ways. Um, and taking it deeper and further and looking at what is it that we as civil society are doing to address some of these issues. And, and last year we partnered with the Catrada Foundation, which I think was, a, was a very useful because it was about also demystifying some of these things. You know, sometimes we might have some of these debates about capture that might be maybe high level and the need to kind of be, um, yeah, I think uh, popularize them. Make it in terms of make them relevant, think about how it affects uh, people of the ground, on the ground in, in different ways in their day-to-day -day lives. So this year we are now also, we're going to be launching the, the papers. We have put out a save the date for a procurement paper to, again, to uh, link up to the, also the public procurement bill process and the public comment process. And then we will launch the, uh, our, our position paper on the recruitment and the appointment and dismissals in the, in the public service. Um, of course, coronavirus <laughs> permitting. So it might be a virtual launch, we're not so sure. But we, and we're also looking forward to, um, to hosting another conference towards the end of the year to again continue the conversation and, and possibly also supplement some of the research that we've done so far and looking at other areas, you know, the possibility of maybe regulatory bodies uh, and their work and what needs to be done there. So I'm just going to stop there. And that's just to give you a sense of where we are at the moment. Thanks. Tracy? Me. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. Um, so, so just briefly, one of the other areas of work we're having um, a look at is to try and push back a little bit against these very simplistic narratives um, of, of corruption. Mm -hmm. So some of the work we're having a look at there touches on what Mbongoseni was saying about this, the political agenda and this idea of radical economic transformation. Um, and obviously, you know, empowering the Guptas to fly around the world is not radical <coughs> economic transformation, but there is um, an element of truth and resonance in that that I think it's very important that we don't neglect in the conversation going forward about state reform and building a different kind of state. We really see a pushback in some people saying, well, you know, everything must just be about merit and um, uh, BE policies or contributing to procurement fraud. And I think what we're having a look at is this idea of the existence of um, a moral economy, of it, particularly in respect of transformation and of making good the economic exclusion of apartheid. Um, and that where there is a misalignment between how people understand the role of the state in facilitating transformation and what actually happens on the ground, you create these areas where legitimacy is not the same as legality and illegitimacy is not the same as illegality. So what we have found in our work, for example, is that you will go into a little municipality in the middle of nowhere and local small black businesses will say to you, we can never compete with the white businesses if we stick to the rules. It's impossible. They've had 200 years of um, opportunities um, against us. You know, how can we ever compete with them if we stick with the rules? And there's an element in truth in that. And this is not to say you know, that, that we're defending corruption, but the point is that as long as we create that misalignment between the general understanding of what the state is for and people's um, real expectations of what the state is supposed to deliver, we create this, this gray area in which what is really corruption um, can flourish. And so that in, we, we, instead of having just a knee-jerk reaction back to you know, merit and, and, and playing fields, I mean, the same thing with merit of appointment. I mean, in, in, in some small municipalities that, that we go in, 
I mean, the only people literally in the municipality that qualify for positions to work in the municipality are white people. Um, you know, there's, there's been practically no education system in that, in that municipality. There are no opportunities for people. So this idea of, of merit is, is very difficult to understand. Obviously, there are no easy answers in all of this. But as long as we continue to push this conversation under the table, we're in fact creating this greater and greater chasm between um, what people believe the state is for and what the rules actually are. There are, there are a lot of people who believe that um, you know, preferential procurement by the state is actually a very poor remedy for 100 years of economic exclusion. But what we've done, I think, maybe not all of us, but we're creating an environment where, we, where we've completely closed the space for those conversations. It all has to be about everyone must be ethical and moral regeneration and whatever. And we've completely closed the space to have those critical conversations about what is our state for and where it is failing in transformation. And we think that the longer we continue to drive those conversations underground, we're never going to have um, a really honest <coughs> discussion. So that, I think going forward, that is one area of the work also that, that we're looking at, at driving in this respect. Um, so I'm just going to pick up a little bit on some of the stuff that Tracy's talking about and what um, Seni was talking about in terms of a kind of debate inside Parry around how to understand uh, state capture. So um, as Mbonga Seni said, there was a lot of debate in the organization at the time of the betrayal of the Communist Report. What we did in the year after that was to start to kind of go back to some of Perry's broader research that we've been doing on over the last 10 years to get a kind of more systemic sense of what it was that we were looking at that was being spoken about or framed in state capture. And I think that um, what we wanted to do was there was, a, there was a particular moment in a particular project centered around sort of Gupta, Zoom and Network, but there was a more systemic problem about the way in which the states had become um, shaped by a kind of factionalized patronage politics. And it was an attempt to try and look at some of the structural determinants of that beyond just looking at the Zuma administration. And to, you know, and to trace back some of the, these have long structural roots and they, they go right back to apartheid and networks of corruption under apartheid, etc. But they also, so what we were trying to do is, so when Florentia spoke about you know, we dropped the name after capture program because we wanted to think about this phenomenon more systemically. We wanted to incorporate some of the concerns that Tracy was talking about. So we wanted to look what are the systemic drivers of a kind of um, factionalized patronage politics in the South African state, and how can we start to address some of that? One of them is a question of the political economy, which Tracy has partly touched on. So in the area of public procurement, where Carrie's done a lot of work over the last eight years. Um, you know, there, were, there was a debate going on in the state that had become quite polarized or kind of binary. So there was a, there was a position around the need to loosen up public procurement um, sort of very widely to support um, empowerment. And then there was a sort of more narrow technicist approach that became associated with the national treasury, where there was more and more concern about sort of cost overruns and corruption. And so as a result, they were trying to tighten and tighten and tighten sending more practice notes and directives down to municipalities, but it wasn't actually having an effect. And so what Perry's work around sort of reforming the public procurement system was about, was about sort of two moves at once. So making, for example, um, the state far better um, at things like contract management, but actually opening procurement up so that it plays its proper role in social and economic development in the country, which it hasn't been nearly sufficiently. Um, it, has, it has become far too concerned with <coughs> notions of efficiency and cost containment and that kind of, that kind of thing. Perry's reform efforts were trying to push to say actually we need to open that up, it needs to play a more fundamental role in economic transformation and then in particular areas it needs to be, it needs to be uh, more carefully closed in, in particular areas. So the whole point it was trying to bring Perry's analytical work <coughs> on what actually happens in the state, not grand narratives or quick quick analysis of what it looks like that you might have around a dining room conversation. It's about taking sort of 10 years of empirical work and looking about precisely how would you reform certain systems. So the next 
position paper which Florentia mentioned is around um, reforming the recruitment system for public servants. Here too there's a particular and long history. So, you know, in 1994 when the ANC came to power, they faced with a bureaucracy that was staffed by national appointee, you know, national party appointees, by uh, generally white Afrikaans civil servants that they couldn't necessarily trust with the project of this transformation. And quite rightly, they made a decision that they wanted to put enormous control over recruitment in the hands of politicians to, to support a transformation agenda. Um, so somewhat unusually, what South Africa did with the Public Service Act is that it placed recruitment for every single person in the public service hierarchy in the hands of politicians. So politicians can choose to devolve that power to a depart departmental head, and some do. But many don't. And what has happened in the context, so so and that and that project in the, sort of you see it in the late 1990s, people, you know, the NC is using cadre deployment to staff these administrations with people they feel are committed to. At the beginning, it was the RDP, and then of course that that shifted. Um, but over time, what happened is that 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 piece of legislation that gave enormous room and power for politicians to appoint started to be used in dysfunctional ways to appoint net corrupt networks that could then extract resources from the state. So once again, we have this very well-intended piece of legislation, an appropriate piece of legislation for the time, starts to take on a different character as kind of all sorts of other things happen. So procurement also got enormously decentralized. Um, and uh, at this, so, so this sort of coincided with this choice around a particular public service recruitment regime, and that together started to see a lot of um, competition over access to state re resources across this, the state. And a lot of, so whilst there was the work on the betrayal of the Promise Report, a lot of us had been doing long research inside departments like the Department of Education in the Eastern Cape, for example, or local municipality where Tracy has been working, to try and understand how these dy dynamics were playing out. And a lot of it doesn't look like the state capture form that we, we see. A lot of it was about a public servant who comes into their job, they're given a, a particular job description, and they're not entirely sure who their boss is. Is their boss the official person in the hierarchy, or is their boss somebody who has slightly more power in the party, for example? But within the party, there was a lot of disagreement. So, for example, there might be one faction that was trying to push a particular policy agenda in education. They would like to, for example, run the school nutrition program in a particular way. But they were, they were clashing with somebody who wanted to use the school nutrition program in a different way. So there were multiple contestations in the state playing out in departments, which started to paralyze what public officials could do. And so there, were, there was, you know, there's also sort of a narrative around state capacity. What we were seeing is enormous capacity, actually, that was being paralyzed. Mm -hmm. so, so it's about sort of using empirical research on the state to understand what actually happens in these organizations, and then to think back, so how do we change this? So the, that's what these three papers are about. One of them is about appointments in the criminal justice system, and that is very much around enforcement. You know, it's about making sure that the head of, of the Hawks is, you know, has integrity and that kind of thing. But what Parry is really pushing is, is less the enforcement angle of get people into jail, which we agree that that should also be, but more about how do we, we actually change the nature of organizations? How do we make it easier for public servants to do their job? How do we make how do we make it possible that these organizations become more stable so that they can, public servants can do their work? So that's, that's what these papers are fundamentally about. So we make proposals for reforming recruitment processes that still retain power in the hands of politicians as it should be to place, to, to <coughs> choose people they feel are in support of, of policies of, of the democratic government, so to exercise a democratic mandate, but at the same time to try and um, take a little bit of, of the power for appointing civil servants further down the chain and place those in administrative heads and then to, to use institutions like the Public Service Commission to start to play a role in, in appointment process to try and stabilize these organizations. Um, so that's the one thing. And then in public procurement, as I said, it's about trying to balance the sort of um, uh, more effective systems in areas like contract management, holding companies to account and have developing the capacity to do that, but at the same time, actually allowing the state, so giving some back into the DTI in their, in their desire to try and actually use the procurement system to, for economic development. So that's, so that's the idea, is that we're not trying, we want to try and get a more nuanced conversation going about how to reform the state. And the other thing we're also trying to do is to get a kind of lobby for this 
state mm -hmm. to fall. So, for example, I'm sitting on the National Anti-Corruption Reference Group and there might be some corruption watches. Is on the, in fact, David Lewis is one of the co-chairs of that reference group. And a lot of the focus, understandably, is on enforcement. And, and what we're trying to do is also get a conversation going about more systemic issues. You know, how do we, how do we give public servants the space to do their jobs and not just concentrate on high corruption cases, but how do we actually just reform these organizations? Um, so it's, I suppose, and what we had wanted to do was to develop a kind of alliance for state reform, but the word alliance, I think, is making people nervous. So now we're just in the loose network, if any of you are interested in <laughs> getting behind this idea, that we need to look at the sort of systemic problems that have given rise to state capture, not just to look at individuals or personalities as the driver.